Uh, so I'm Ollie Walsh. There's a talk on market sizing. Um, so just a bit about me to start off with. I'm 30 years doing strategic planning, market research for startups and scale-ups mostly. Um, across the ranges from everything from security companies and food companies to tech companies. Um, eight years ago, I co-founded Pipit, which is a, a payments company, um, payments for migrants. And uh, uh, I am now the, the, the CEO of that. So over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to go through you know, what market sizing is, what I see the problems are from you know, 30 years of consulting and working with companies. I'm going to use two examples of market sizing that I've been involved in, one with a physical product and one with Pipit, and then look at a couple of other um, uh, examples of kind of well-known tech companies and how they've done their market sizing. So it being May the 4th and Star Wars Day, I had to start off with a quote from Qui-Gon Jinn. His advice to Anakin was, always remember, your focus determines your reality. Uh, this is a perfectly apt quote for, for this talk because from my experience working with, with companies, they tend to focus way too much on the product or the service and not enough on the market. Um, uh, and um, this is where it leads to, to things, phrases like over-engineering, for example, have come from this, from, from overly focusing on the product and not focusing on the market. So what, what is the requirements of market sizing? You know, it's, it's really just the basics is knowing how many people are in the market that are actually going to pay for your product. Um, not how big the market is, how many are going to pay for it is the most important part. And this feeds into all the other metrics for your business. Most importantly, uh, obviously, is the potential revenue. Um, revenue then breaks into break-even point, which is a kind of an old metric for tech companies. Um, kind of the modern approach to break-even point is if you're breaking even, you're not growing fast enough. Um, but uh, traditionally, you choose break-even point, uh, profit and resource requirements. So, I mean, a, a lot of business plans I come across have have you know big targets, big revenue models. But the resources they've allocated don't match that. They don't meet up. And, and this is a big red flag when you're looking for funding that, that you actually don't have the cap capacity. Uh, I, I reviewed a business plan for a, a Galway construction company recently, and their targets in their business plan was actually twice their capacity. But they hadn't realized because they were just making up numbers. Uh, with the resource requirements to match what your market sizing is or what you're targeting, segmenting your market. Uh, targeting, positioning. Uh, I'm going to do another talk next week on, on segmenting specifically. Um, and then your marketing and your business strategy. How are you going to get your product to your customers? Um, the, the actual distribution part of it, um, a lot of companies really underestimate how difficult it is to get distribution, whether it's a physical product or, or a, a, a virtual product. And all of this leads into funding. So all this is the information that you need to get your funding. So the problems around uh, that I see in my experience around market sizing is that tech product companies uh, tend to focus too much on the product. Like I said, uh, I, I reviewed a business plan recently for a med tech company in Dublin, about a 40 page plan, but 20 pages of it was on the product and then one page on the market. And they, they sent a plan to me because they're having trouble getting funding. Uh, I switched this around and did, you know, the, the product was brilliant. Um, uh, the team behind were brilliant. Everything was brilliant, but investors only need to know so much about the product. They kind of take for, take it as read that your product works and does what it's supposed to do. How big is the market? How are we going to guess the products in the market? Um, so, so really the, the focus needs to be on, on how are you going to sell this? Um, innovative companies tend to be founded by domain experts. And this is the whole point of an ecosystem, and like the Portership, which we're part of here. Galway has such a big med tech hub because of people spinning off ideas out of Boston Scientific and out of the various med tech companies locally. Uh, this is where they get their expertise. This is where they have ideas. And then they go and found, found their own companies. But they're domain experts. And business and strategy is a separate skill. Um, uh, I, I was at uh, Enterprise Ireland event recently, we've got 100 founders in a room, and the, the speaker asked how many people here have any sort of a, a qualification or experience in business, and there's only me and one other person out of around 100 business owners have had any sort of a business background. Um, and it's kind of, a lot of times it's kind of taken as background noise, the whole running of the business, in favor of what the product is and product development and engineering and, and the exciting stuff. Um, so like we, we, we need these ecosystems but because uh, that's what fuels growth and fuels innovation. Innovation comes from, from those domain expert, expertise, um, but it, it, it needs to be 
matched with market focus. Uh, entrepreneurs can overestimate their market value or their market sizing, which is kind of an unintended bias. Um, a lot of what I do is, like in consultancy wise, is reviewing other people's plans because you would generally find that there's some sort of unintended bias in it because people love their own products. You know, inventors, entrepreneurs are very passionate people, passionate about what they do, and it comes across in the plan. And that you need to be, but you need to keep keep reality in there. Um, you know, that med tech example. You know, they had for their market sizing everybody in the world in hospital because the device was um, a response to a condition you only catch in hospital. But that wasn't correct. It's only people who have this condition are the market size, not everybody who potentially could get it. So they had vastly over, overestimated the market size. Um, and quite often I hear that everybody or the whole world is my market, and it's never, ever true. Um, you know, Amazon isn't a global company. They're not in Africa because of the distribution issues of Africa, they can't guarantee to get the product to a person's house. So they only do, I think, two or three countries in Africa. PayPal isn't in Latin America because of local legal restrictions. So they're soon launching Chile, but that'll be their first Latin American. So a lot of these like, big international brands we think of as global aren't because there is limitations. So when you're starting off, you, know, you, you need uh, like a strategy behind growth, which you might launch in Ireland and then Europe or wherever your market is. So the methods and variables, I mean, there's, there's, there's called demand side or, or, or supply side or bottom up or top down are kind of two main ways of, of measuring the market or measuring market size. Customer segmentation, how does the market break down? Um, you know, this is you know, the, the, the basis of, of marketing. You know, the, the reason that Ford or Toyota or Kellogg's have 20 different products is because one is for each segment. It's not just people don't just buy a car, they buy one that suits them for whatever reasons. So what, are, what is the market segment? How do they break down? The occasions and frequency of consumption, which changes dramatically from a car to a breakfast cereal. So you're, you know, the, the pricing differences are different, but obviously the whole consumption of those products are different as well. Um, frequency of purchase and repair is slightly different from uh, consumption because you know, uh, some, like you would face your car every three years, for example. So that's the kind of frequency in the consumption. From the supply side, you can look at the value volume of um, what your competitors are doing. How big is their market? You know, you can use, I'll, I'll come to source of information in a second, but you can use, you know, open domain information to know how big the market is in, in the country in terms of sales. What is the capacity to grow that? How saturated is the market? Also, how, how, how strong are the competitors? How are you going to differentiate your product? How are you going to attract customers? All this comes in, in, into the market sizing. Um, and then regardless of demand or supply side, sales volume, sales growth, seasonality, distribution strategy. Um, distribution strategy is, is, is one that I, I find people find particularly tri difficult because, you know, I've worked with hardware products where people have assumed they're just going to get into Woody's and B&Q and um, whatever the big brands are in the States. Uh, but it's not that easy. Uh, it's extremely difficult to get a product to market through distribution channels. And even if it is within, you know, you're launching an app, Apple have recently got much more um, restrictive on, on what can be launched through their network. And you're really, you have one distribution channel then really, you know. And then the time period for um, usually market, market sizing is done as an annual time period. Um, and then the ge geography of where your market is, again, it's not the whole world. And test is political, economic, social, and technological differences. So what's happening in the market that could positively or adversely affect what you're launching. How do you find this out? Market research. So where does this information come from? So big global bodies like the UN and the EU and the World Bank, I mean, from, from Pippet, from a payments perspective, this is where we get most of our information. The World Bank and the EU or the UN have all the information that I need in terms of remittance flows across countries, how many people in account and each country in the world have bank accounts, how many use payment accounts. All this information is, is relatively freely available. Um, trade reports are always quite good, although they can be slightly overly positive sometimes because they're reports for their own trade. Um, competitor websites, you'd be surprised how much good information you can get from your competitor websites. They can frequently give away what their sales are, for example, or what countries they're in. So um, you, can, you can find a lot of good market sizing information. And then you have the likes of Mintel, Statista, Garner Group, which are market research bodies. Usually you can kind of get three or four year old reports from these guys free. Anything new is expensive, um, but Enterprise Ireland has um, access to all of these. So if you're an Enterprise Ireland client, 
you can request access to it. You now you have to actually physically go to uh, Mayor View where their offices are. They, they will find the documents and bring them down to you. And you, you have to read them there. Um, uh, but you know these reports are five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a piece. So to, to get free access to them is good. So it's called secondary research, which you do first counterintuitively, but it's you're researching existing information, which is why it's called secondary. Then primary is is focus groups and questionnaires which is in that order, focus groups being a, getting a small group, usually five to eight people together, ask them questions, demoing a product, ask them what they use it, ask them how much they pay for it. And you can kind of use their responses to frame the questions in your questionnaire. Uh, and again, this is where, you know, um, the unintended bias comes in that you, you, you when you're, you're writing your own questionnaire, you can tend to unintentionally phrase questions in a way that elicits the answer you want. Um, so you need to kind of get the, get the questions from independent people. So some examples. We'll start off with the physical product. So this is the Air Glide, which is a golf product, obviously, that I was involved with from the idea. Uh, idea it was a company I was a co-founder of called Invention Services. So from the idea through to the prototyping, through to the design, patenting, manufacturing, all the way to the shelf, um, uh, I was involved in this. And what's different with this is this part here is a patented spring system. So this handle expanded and contracted, um, which we got NUIG to test for us. And that, that, that spring system absorbed about 60% of um, the energy required to pull the trolley. So it was a, an energy saving device. Um, uh, so we, we eventually licensed this to a Canadian company called Caddy who took on the distribution. So we got this into Irish, UK, European, US, Canadian and Australian stores. Um, so how do we work on the market sizing for this, for example? So we started off in Ireland because it's our home market. Um, again, the distribution is was a, a, a key issue because uh, one, one of the big lessons I've learned over the last 30 years is that everybody loves new products and innovation, but nobody wants it first. Everybody wants to see somebody else using it first. One of the big things in distribution is what's the break rate of a, of a, of a given product? How, how many of them are going to come back? And if you haven't sold them, you don't know that question. And then you can't sell them until you do know it. So no, no uh, distributors will buy it off us because we didn't know how many out of a thousand will break because they have to factor that into the pricing. Uh, so we ended up buying a thousand of these ourselves and distributing them um, in Irish Irish stores. Obviously, it's been our home market. That's where you started. So how big was the potential market? So golfers in Ireland, 125,000. We know that from the Golfing Union of Ireland, keep a register of all members of golf clubs. So a trade body, it got the results from. Uh, total golf market uh, for products, not including paying for membership and stuff like that, was 39 million in that year, which we got from um, the Irish Sports Council uh, had, had done, had commissioned research on, on, on the golf industry. So we were able to access that. And that gives us an average of 312 euros per person being spent in the market. The golf cart market uh, was 12% of the total. So including clubs and golf balls and jumpers and all this other stuff. Uh, the cars was about four and a half million of that with an average cost of a golf cart of 175 euros. So that gave us about 25,000 carts being sold in Ireland that year. Uh, all of this was information that was secondary. It all came from some other source. I then went around to about 10 driving ranges around Ireland with the trolley and set up focus groups, organized with the golf, uh, with the driving range in advance, obviously, but I went in cold and just you know, you five people, they got 20 minutes to look at this product. And we did test and them, showed them how it worked, what it did, the purpose, the labor saving. And we really strongly found out that this was for men over 45. Men under 45 wouldn't use it because they wouldn't be seen to use something that was labor saving because they're so tough. Um, men over 45 all had back problems, all had shoulder problems, all had neck problems. And this is the kind of product they wanted. Uh, women, both age groups, took more care of themselves so they didn't have as many as many ailments as the men over 45. So this then really scaled down the market that, that, that was our market. So it was men over 45, which was 40% of the golfers. Again, we knew this from Golfing Union of Ireland. So that was about 10,000 carts in Ireland would be sold to men over 45 in that year. And that's our market size. Our margin on this was 12 euros per product, which is 125,000 was our potential market size for Ireland. That's pretty small. Ireland's a small market. Um, 
so once you scale it up to UK, US, then, then you, you do this market size for each country to scale it up. So uh, some, a small aside on, on the product testing. So this was a cart that belonged to the distributor. We put our device onto it. This is an existing cart. We put our device onto it and we got samples to test. So we brought it out from golf courses. We tested it. We had other people testing it. We attacked it with hammers. We tried to break it. We dropped it off walls, all this kind of stuff. It was great. Of the thousand we ordered, the wheels broke off 900. So we had to, re we had to reimburse everybody. We just didn't test the wheels because we assumed it was an existing trolley. Somebody else has tested these wheels. So in terms of debugging or testing your product, test all of it. Uh, and that's essentially destroyed the Irish market for us because retailers wouldn't take it back again because they were getting the flack from the customer because of broken products. So we had to kind of start again uh, in the UK, which we did. So Pipit market sizing. So Pipit uh, has been through a couple of iterations or pivots. Um, we started off as a cash for e-commerce. So our original, initial market was uh, people who either were unbanked or people who had security concerns about making payments online. So the model worked with you go onto a website, you order your product, you get one of our barcodes sent to your phone, and you can go to any pay zone in the country and scan the barcode and pay cash over the counter. That was our initial model. Uh, so unbanked people was 5% of the Irish population, the Irish adult population. That might sound high, but the, the unbanked numbers in each market, even in developed Western countries, is surprisingly high. In the US, it's about 10% of adults don't have a bank account of any sort. Uh, and security conscious was about 10%. So the unbanked we got from um, Central Bank of Ireland report, and the security conscious we got from a, a visa report on payments. So this gave us about 600 people, 600,000 adults in Ireland who are a potential market. So who of those were online shoppers? Now, because they're unbanked or security conscious, they weren't necessarily shopping online now, but uh, we asked the question, like, how many of these people would like to shop online? So we did this ourselves, and we initially did, um, again, we did focus groups. And, you know, I went into GMIT, marketing class, and into uh, AIT, whatever they're called now. Uh, we did in-person in, in, in discussions on it, focus groups. Um, we found about 30% of people who currently weren't shopping online would if there was a way to, for them to make a payment. Um, this again was skewed. We did we did an online research. We did about a thousand people completed an online questionnaire, and we found that it was really skewed towards the younger end of the market doing it, making the payment. So, about thirty percent of people um, said they would use a system like Pipit. Uh, Seventy-eight euros is the average um, internet transaction in Ireland, which came from the Internet Irish Internet Association annual report, which gives us about thirteen point five million. And now we knew we scaled this down to sixteen to twenty-five euros, which is about forty percent of the total which gives us a market of 5.6 million market size in Ireland of people who would potentially use this. We charge a 3.5% fee, which is 196,000 um, of a market, market size for Ireland. So I should have mentioned these in the last one. So this, all of this is your potential addressable market. So that's the, you know, the, the entire fit of market, uh, which is our unbanked and security conscious people. And then that comes down to the total addressable market, so the people who will actually use your product. And then that comes down to the service addressable market. Um, some of these graphs also use a service and obtainable market, which I think is kind of the same thing, so I just never use it. Um, so you're basically shrinking down your market to, to who are the real potential buyers. So after we'd launched Pipit in Ireland for e-commerce, um, through a process of Basically, I, I moved to England to do an accelerator and I experienced how difficult it is to open a bank account in a new country. And uh, we started researching, well, how are migrants getting money home? How are they opening bank accounts? And then we kind of found out how much money has been sent in Western Union and how much it costs. And then we said, well, you know, it costs 9.5% of the transaction total to send money from the UK to Africa. So we said, we can do it a lot cheaper. And we've already got a cash platform so we started researching bill payments in um, Africa. We connected with a couple of aggregators over there so we can pay bills across, uh, I think it's 18 countries in Africa now, electricity bills, water bills, phone, et cetera. So we started looking at the UK um, market for remittance to Africa. So $6.3 billion was sent three years ago from the UK to Africa in remittance. This market, this one here, 
we focus entirely on num numbers, remittance numbers, because they're quite reliable. The, the numbers for um, the number of Africans migrating into UK uh, was a vast scope of, there was like millions in the difference between, you know, the, the, the UK government's information and the UN's information, for example. So you will find that there, there are quite, quite a lot of variables um, within kind of, you know, professional information. Um, you know, for, for, for the amount of cash in total that's remitted, the UN says about 15% of the total, where the World Bank says about 30%, which is quite a difference. So we always go with the, or I always go with the most, the most conservative number to give the most conservative um, market size. So we scale down then to UK to Nigeria remittance market for our total addressable market. So that's 3.8 billion was sent from the UK to Nigeria in cash, sorry, in, in, in remittance in total. So why do we focus in Nigeria? Um, this comes back to the resources for your market sizing. To do a campaign to target 50 different nationalities of Africans living in the UK would have been a massive, massive marketing budget, as opposed to focusing on one uh, uh, group within the country uh, and their Nigerians. We pick Nigeria because it is the biggest receiver of remittance from the UK. Uh, and we already had the bills, so we knew we were able to service this market. Um, <clears throat> we know from the Nigerian bill pay, so the serviceable, serviceable adjustable market, we know again from the UN, that, or sorry, from the World Bank, that on average of 15% of money that is remitted is spent on bills. Um, so that gives us down to 600 million. So the 3.5% fee this is a $21 million market. So it's a sizable compared to our Irish uh, e-commerce market. Uh, so one of the keys of this is that you know your your market is never the same. You know you need to keep redoing this. Your market grows, it shrinks. Um, a good example for the golf trolley was when we launched that trolley, all trolleys were pulled behind you. There was no such thing as a push trolley; they didn't exist. So 100 percent of the market was pulled. After about five years of us having the product, somebody launched a push trolley, and that pest political, technical, social, technological. The social part of it, the cultural part of it, the entire market switched to push trolleys. So in the space of two years, they went from no pull tro push trolleys at all to 95% of the market being push. And then we had to re-engineer our product because we had to do two market sizes. We had to re-engineer the product for the spring to go the other way. Um, so, so the market isn't static. So your market sizing isn't static. You need to keep on top of it. And as you're re releasing new products in new countries, it keeps changing. So some other examples, this is Airbnb. So their market size is 1.9 billion trips booked annually, 532 million being budget or online bookings. And then their market share was 10.6 million um, bookings. Um, so that's how they work it out. So that's based on bookings, not based on revenue as how they've market sized it. Uh, although they, they take 10% of the, the booking fee, that's, that's the revenue model. This is Revolut. So they make their money on cross currency transactions. So that's why Revolut has no fees or very little fees or account fees or you know, joining fees um, because they make like, it's called arbitrage, which is the difference between the, the value of the money. There's a, 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 when you're converting pounds to euros, the, the bit that the bank keeps is their, is their revenue model. So $1.4 trillion of cross country, uh, cross uh, currency tran transactions, um, I think this is in Europe. Fees, 60 billion in fees per annum for just transferring your money from one currency to another. Uh, travelers and expats is 1.5 billion of that. Uh, this is um, transactions where that's money, obviously. Uh, so UK was your initial target, which was 3 billion market size with 60 million travelers. So that's how they size their market based on how much the revenue opportunity was and the market. How many people travel to the UK every year? Uh, obviously, the UK is its own currency, so that's revenues aren't making any money in Europe because we've all the one currency. And this one is um, Shopify. So this is their potential global market, uh, and their their uh, TAM is essentially English-speaking countries: UK, Canada, Australia, North America. Australia, sorry, New Zealand, and they do some of Western Europe as well, but it's primarily the English speaking countries is how they've decided to do their targeting. So that's, um, you know, what, what, what market sizing is 
the, the, the pitfalls to watch out for, how it's done, how it's constructed, where you get the information from. For me, it's always a key metric in every business plan is the market size and it's done correctly. Um, you know, there's the follow on to doing it correctly is how much that market can you capture? And you will frequently see in a business plan 1%. It's like the default setting in a business plan is we're going to get 1% of the market, which is a big red flag for funders because it means you haven't thought about it. You just pick 1%. So looking at your resources, looking at your funding, looking at your strategy, looking at your distribution, looking at your capacity to build the product, you know how many you can make. So your 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 target needn't be 1%. It can be we're going to get $10 million of this market, and that's based on the fact that we can build this many. And if that's 0.1% or 6%, you know, you, you've built it on something reliable uh, as opposed to just assuming a percentage. Um, other common mistakes. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say there. So mark, market size is the key metric. Um, it's not a constant. Like I said, it needs to be constantly reassessed. Um, a lot of information out there um, existing There's more every day. Uh, a lot of these reports have really good information. And so a lot of the, the, the facts behind um, what you need for building and market sizing are, do exist. But talking to your actual market and getting information from actual customers or potential customers will really hold in what that market is. Uh, so I mean, this, ultimately, a lot of this information is used for, for funding, but it's, it's a key information for your company internally for what you're trying to build or what you're trying to do. Uh, so oliwalsh.com is my own website, which has ramblings and thoughts and giving out about stuff. Pippa Global is a company website. Any questions? Yes. Um, although the likes of you know um, the Marketing Institute also has access to them. Um, so a lot of a lot of professional institutes have access to these reports as well. So um, I think as a graduate from NYG, you can even use their library. So so a lot of reports are in there. So um, but for Enterprise Ireland, yes, you have to be a you have to be a, a HPSU designated company. Although I don't know, maybe, maybe Leo can access them locally. I'm not sure. Yeah, the, the 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 scale of the research you've done yourself is is the key part there. So, you know, the the the, the kind of the initial focus group is qualitative information. So you're getting a small amount of, of information from people, but it's, it's high quality. And then the researched questionnaire is, is quantitative. So you take that small bit of information you have and turn it into a questionnaire. So, you know, with the social media world, you can kind of get a lot of responses to questionnaires yourself online. You can build them online, whereas, you know, not so long ago, you have to pay a research company to, to go and do it for you, which you still can do. Um, it can be good to get somebody external to do it as well because it, it you know that, that takes out the, the unintended bias out of it as well but take the research you have already and then scale it up and you know distribute it through the arts council or the arts office where they share it uh, and, and try and, and try and connect with people who are in your 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 market your industry <laughs>